Coming up on DTNS, India widens its ban on Chinese apps, Microsoft's three-part plan to fight deepfakes, and why refresh rates won't help your game skills. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020 in the tiny little town of Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. The vast metropolis of Salt Lake City. I'm Scott Johnson. Uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking about uh, Sarah's experience watching The Wire and Scott's experience seeing Metallica at a drive-in theater. If you want to get that expanded conversation, become a member and get good day internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Samsung has hopped on the trend of mid-range 5G phones, announcing the 6.6-inch Super AMOLED Galaxy A42 5G with a rear quad cam layout. It's launching later this year, but we don't have a price yet. Samsung also announced the 10.4-inch Galaxy Tab A7 tablet with quad Dolby Atmos speakers in gold, silver, and gray. No pricing for that either, though. And the wireless charger trio, this is the one I'm actually kind of excited about, which can charge three devices at once. Sam Mobile says it will sell it for 99 euros. JBL announced five new Bluetooth speakers. The JBL Go 3, uh, it's an IP67 dust and waterproof uh, device with five hours of battery life for $39.95. That'll happen in October. The chip 4 has a carbon, uh, excuse Clip. me, a what did I say? Oh, I didn't say it right. The Clip 4 has a carbiner, uh, is an IP67 as well, and 10 hours of battery life. That's a lot. That'll be in Europe in November and December here in the U.S. for $69.95. The Extreme 3 is improved drivers and base with 15 hours of battery and a phone charger uh, and syncing capability in Europe in October and November in the U.S. for $349.95. And the party box on the go comes with lights and the wireless mic, plus mic and guitar inputs as well as auxiliary and USB. That's in Europe now, and in U.S. Uh, it'll end up on or end up here on October 25th for two hundred dollars, two hundred ninety-nine dollars ninety-five cents. And the party box 310 has all that and a handle and wheels with 240 watts of sound in Europe later this month in the U.S. October 25th, four ninety-nine ninety-five. After previewing new chips at Architecture Day 2020 or earlier this year, Intel officially announced its first 11th gen Tiger Lake processors for laptops with Thunderbolt 4 support, Wi Fi 6. You can get uh, episodes to know a little more that'll explain what those are. Bumps in performance and battery life over the Ice Lake line. The 11th gen designs will be in Intel's U series, now called UP3, and Y series class chips, or UP4, led by the Core i7 118 5G7, base speed starting at 3 gigahertz, a maximum single core turbo boost of up to 4.8 gigahertz, and a maximum all core boost of up to 4.3 gigahertz. Tiger Lake also features Intel's Iris Z or XE integrated graphics with 96 CUs and a maximum graphic speed of 1.35 gigahertz. Has a built in AI engine, which Intel says will improve video calls support. Uh, such as better background blurring. And it can also support an 8K HDR display or up to four 4K displays at once. Products with Tiger Lake inside are going to start arriving this autumn, and there will be a bunch of them. Designed to offset a new digital services tax introduced by the UK government, Apple is adding an extra 2% on developer fees on the App Store in the UK on top of the usual 20% value-added tax known as VAT or VAT. Google's increasing fees for all advertising bought on Google Ads and YouTube in the UK by 2% as well. And starting September 1st, Amazon is also incre increasing fees, so that was yesterday, for third-party sellers by 2%. Meanwhile, Reuters reports that Russian lawmaker Fedot Tumasov, a member of the State Duma, which is Russia's, Russia's lower house in its par parliament, has proposed a bill that would see all Apple Store transactions capped at 20%, down from its usual 30 Will that work? Not sure yet, but it is being proposed. The law would also mandate that a third of the App Store Commission would be paid to the Russian government in a fund to train people in IT. Uh, this must just drive Apple crazy. Not, not even the, the conflict, just the idea of different percentages in different countries. Uh, it's a, a fortnight moment happening in Russia. Uh, podcast production company Parcast, which uh, Spotify acquired last year, is unionizing company says it wants a commitment from Spotify to cover things like overtime compensation, clear job descriptions, equitable pay, transparent salary bans, 
and movement around creative and IP. Spotify now, uh, or sorry, now can choose to recognize the union voluntarily, which would be followed by contact or contract negotiations, or request a vote from union members to prove that they have support. Spotify owned Gimlet Media and The Ringer are also organized through the WGAE union, and still that is in negotiations. All right, let's talk a little bit about India. India's IT ministry has said that the Indian Cybercrime Coordination Center and Home Ministry sent a recommendation, which sounds like it's optional, but it's not, to block 118 more apps considered, quote, prejudicial to sovereignty and integrity of India, defense of India, security of state, and public order. So when they order these blocks, that means the app stores have to keep them from being downloaded. ISPs get the order as well. I'm not sure exactly what, if anything, they're expected to do. Uh, there are ways around it if you're using a VPN and such, but essentially it makes it really hard to get these apps if you're in India. Among the list of Chinese apps being blocked this time are popular game PUBG, several of the WeChat spinoffs, and Baidu. Uh, the main version of WeChat was already blocked, along with TikTok previously, uh, but they had a few, you know, WeChat branded sub apps that are now on the list as well. A total of 224 Chinese apps have now been ordered blocked in India. Uh, you know, second most populous nation on earth next to China in a border dispute with China. Uh, we talk about Gosh, what if the U.S. were to, to stop WeChat from being available in the App Store? Uh, India is not only doing that to WeChat, but to 224 Chinese apps. And then it's already done it. No, no, in 45 days, unless you sell or anything, they're gone in, in, right, right. in a huge country. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, given how some of these things are playing out in other places, such as the U.S., and how it's being played out differently. You know, India kind of going like, no, nah, you're just blocked. We don't, we don't, we don't want these apps. I mean, maybe if the Chinese apps in question could come back and uh, figure something out. Sorry about that. My phone is ringing. Don't want to talk to you right now. Um, uh, if 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 there could be some negotiation in the future, maybe so. But you know, India taking a hard line here, and yeah, like you mentioned, Tom. I mean, a lot of people in India. And there are a lot of other apps they can use. Yeah, I did the interesting bit to me. The reason I was I was super curious about the PUBG being kind of singled out. And it's because they did single them out in their par parliamentary standing committee. They brought it up uh, as an issue, given, given its effect on youth. Like, hey, a lot of kids play this. We're concerned about that. And it's Chinese. Shut it down. No, like Tom said, no 45 days. No go past go. Just straight to jail for these apps. And it's quite the precedent for a giant country. Well. If I told you that there was a new gadget called the Premiere, what would you think it was? Oh, man. Uh, Anybody? I, I, I already know, so I can't really imagine. What right. Yeah, I guess I guess not. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> My imagination is failing you. me. <laughs> All right, I'll just tell you. Samsung announced the Premiere, which is a 4K short throw laser projector. Samsung says it can be placed directly in front of a wall and still present an optimal picture. So that's good for folks who say, well, I don't really have a room to mount a projector and you know get that distance and, and all the things that might have uh, held them back before. The Premiere includes woofers, an acoustic beam, virtual surround sound as well. And the Premiere LS9, P9T rather, offers up to a 130 inch projection with peak displays of 2,800 ANSI lumens and HDR10+. There's also the LSP7T with 100, uh, 120 inch projection and a little bit less brightness. Both models uh, support the UHD filmmaker mode and they're coming to Europe and the US and Korea later this year, but again, don't have prices. I'm guessing expensive uh, if I had to guess, but I have friends and family in particular, I just talked to them about this the other day that are eyeing this and want this real bad. So projection enthusiasts and those who have maybe makeshift and or really well-made home theater systems, pro probably pretty stoked. About this yeah, part. short short throw isn't new, uh, but as Sarah said, it, it's super convenient. So some people were willing to take a hit in quality uh, in order to have the convenience of being able to just put it up against the wall and not have to, to figure out where to stick it in a small room. But this is up in the game, 130 inch screen projection, max 4K, uh, with some nice sound. Uh, this, like you say, Scott, probably going to be pricey, but 
uh, it is something that is super convenient. And as we've heard from Robert Heron every time he's on the show, uh, you know, projection is his favorite because it gives you flexibility and high quality at the same time. Right. And you're going to, is it going to last you a while? <clears throat> 4K, you know, we, we still, there's still the conversation about whether 4K is truly giving you that much more than 1080p. And certainly would 8K even do less uh, for your overall experience. This is going to last a while. This will be expensive, but an investment that will make sense for a lot of people. I mean, I'm. Yeah, I forget the 4K. It's the HDR10 plus plus the brightness. That 2800 yeah, anti lumens on the LSP90. That's that's great. Yeah, the 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 brightness is huge in this situation. Like anybody who's tried to do projection theater, it's terrible if you have bad lumens. So that's huge. Like I feel like this is gonna gonna, gonna tide people over for a long time, and they'll be okay investing a little extra money. Yeah. Well, when Samsung I mean, gives you lumens. Say, yeah. hey, great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Samsung. I also just. Having gone through a somewhat challenging uh, mounting of my TV when I moved into the place that I live now because it's above a fireplace, mm. I also have the added complexity of all of my walls are wood panel. So we'd have to rethink that before you'd have to get it became... A, you'd have to get a screen, you know, which does a, complicate a it a screen little. Or, you know, cleverly paint or, you know, sure. that sort of thing. But, but the idea of just having fewer things that have to be mounted that are heavy and there's cords, you know, and that, and, and more kind of like, oh, where do you want to project this right now type thing? You know, even if there's a piece of art, you know, take it off the wall. Now you, you know, now you have a TV. That's pretty cool. That's right. Turn lumens into luminade. All right, moving <laughs> on. I'm not just fishing for titles, I promise. Twitter will add pinned tweets and short descriptions to some trending topics so you can figure out why they're trending in 17 different markets. Twitter says more than 500,000 people tweeted the words, why is this trending? That's the uh, the entire phrase in 2019. Pinned tweets will be suggested by an algorithm and chosen by a human person as opposed to a robot person. Descriptions will be human written also. Twitter announced the launch of two new accessibility teams. The ACE team will work on accessibility within Twitter from uh, office space to policy standards. And the EAT team will work on making products and features more accessible. Automated captions for audio and video are expected to launch in early 2021. Ah, uh, that's so good. That is so good. Twitter uh, took a lot of heat when they put out uh, some of the audio stuff, particularly for not having captions, just that's making right. it inaccessible. Uh, so this is this is long overdue, but good job, Twitter, on that. Uh, the trending thing, Sarah. I know we were talking in, in our pre-show that. Neither one of us really look at the trending topics, but every once in a while you do run across that thing where you're like, why is this being tweeted by people so much? Oh, very much so. I, I use a third party app. I use Tweetbot. There are others. And, but you know, I, I think Tom, you said you use regular web Twitter, but you don't really look at trending topics. And so I do see that a lot. Why is this trending? And I don't know the context because I'm like, ah, I just don't, you know, things trend all the time. And, you know, and then you kind of like, is it global or is it U.S. only? And who's got the time? Some yeah. of you do, and that's fine. But, <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, it, Good for you. To, to have a little bit more context in those times where I'm like, but why is this trending? What, what's the news story? Because I sometimes end up blind searching and kind of looking at stuff right. where I'm like, I'm not really sure what this all is. And then I have to parse it. And if Twitter is saying, hey, let's curate this a little bit more by giving you contextual information, especially if it's a news topic, and pin some stuff at the top, that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I, I like you say, I, I use the regular old Twitter app, but I never go to the trending topics. I highly recommend never go to the trending topics. Do not use it as a news source. It will make your life better. But I will see those hashtags in the people I follow, and I'll be like, why is Abe Vigoda hashtag? What is it this time? Like, and And so then I might actually go to trending topics in the future to get that explanation. I think this is a really good feature. Yeah, and maybe, and maybe there would be fewer fake so-and-so died because that's what people always assume oh, yeah. anytime anyone's trending on Twitter. Yeah, like if, if somebody, who's the last remaining golden girl? Or, I forgot her name, sorry. Oh, uh, Betty, Estelle White. Getty. Betty White? Betty, Betty White. So when I see Betty White's name in How trending, I do what other people do. I freak out. I go, no, Betty White, national treasure. She can't be dead. And I'll go look at the trending stuff. And it's, no, she did a video with Snoop Dogg or something. <laughs> but and, yeah, but that's a very good example. If you're like, oh, no, oh, no. Is right. this what I think it is? Yeah, Why is it trending? It almost you know? never is, but now you can be sure. Right? Yep, there you go. Yeah. Uh, this story is so February 2020. Uh, a tech conference is happening with people <laughs> attending it. Uh, the first tech conference to host attendees in person 
since before March. IFA kicks off in Berlin September 3rd. We've been talking about, you know, stuff happening in advance of IFA or IFA announcements coming out because Samsung usually has a huge uh, booth at IFA. They're not this year. They're just doing their announcements on their own. But there are some companies at IFA in Berlin displaying to the 5,000 people attending. Usually this conference has 200,000 attendees or more. Uh, they are limiting attendance per day. I think, I couldn't find exact confirmation except back when they announced it in April, but at that time they were saying it would be limited to 1,000 per day. So if you've got a three-day conference, that's 3,000. Plus you have the vendors and there's like 800 journalists uh, attending in person. So that probably gets it up to, to 5,000. Most of the business of IFA is still being done virtually. Everything's streaming online. You can go see all the announcements as they happen online without being there. But uh, I find it interesting where CES was going to have an in-person in January, then backed off of it because they said they just didn't think people were comfortable that IFA stuck to their guns uh, in Germany, which is having a little bit of a resurgence, very small one, uh, of the virus saying, no, we think if we just limit it, we can do it safely and it's still worth doing. Yeah, I, uh, I think this may be, well, I don't know if it'll be a trendsetter or not, because we'll have to see. They're kind of, I was talking before the show, they're kind of in a weird rock and hard place, because if even one person gets sick, then this is going to be called, oops, too soon, what have we done? Mm -hmm. um, if nobody gets sick, I'd be shocked, because you're going to have people who are just sick anyway, or came sick, has nothing to do with the convention, they didn't know they had it when they left. People they got, always, we're already talking about that from CES last year in January. Like, oh, people got sick. Maybe it was the coronavirus. Like, well, maybe, but also it was CES. People always get sick at these things. Yeah, I had people in November from BlizzCon who were super sick and thought, well, maybe, maybe we it was early. Yeah. And there were a lot of Chinese players from the esports teams there, and they brought it with them. And, you know, we the, people can go on for days about speculation about this sort of thing. So I feel like they're kind of hosed either way. And I just hope it's a good conference for those who attend and that it's as mm -hmm. minimum amount of spread of anything as possible but i don't i don't see how it feels like a no win to me on the other end of it but. and you have to assume that uh, you know everyone involved with uh putting ifa on has thought long and hard about how to, to keep people as safe as possible and i have no doubt that they will do their best i have never been to ifa but if i'm going to compare it to a variety of other conventions i've been to yeah it's kind of shoulder to shoulder situation you're touching things a lot of this is tactile things where you're like oh cool let me look at this P pick it up that kind of thing and you know handshaking and just none of that will be able to happen and you have much fewer people uh, in any sort of enclosed area at one time it can be done i guess in theory but i i hope for the best well, um, let's hope for the best here. It, this is actually kind of cool. Acer announced the 24.5-inch Predator X25 gaming monitor with a 360 hertz refresh rate. You heard me right, people. That means frames are displayed every 2.8 milliseconds. The Predator X25 rather also comes with the NVIDIA G-Sync processor to reduce tearing and runs NVIDIA's Reflex Latency Analyzer to report on mouse and monitor and PC performance. No price. No availability yet, but if you're wondering if this is something that you actually want or need, sounds cool, but do your eyes need this? Alex Wiltshire over at PC Gamer had a really good write-up about frame rates and refresh rates and what the human eye can really see and what it actually can't. Turns out, among other things, peripheral vision is different than straight ahead vision. So detecting motion is different than detecting light, for example. And when you can probably see the difference above about 20 hertz, in fact, people who game more often get better at it, it doesn't mean it'll make you a better game player. So if you're already questioning and arguing, go read that article for more. But I guess the question now is, if you know that you're not going to be better at a game by seeing better, do you care about seeing better? Well, and also, can you actually tell the difference? And there's also a tendency for gamers to, I've done this, you, you'll you'll see something that's previous gen, and then you'll see new gen, and you'll go, ooh, you can see how different it is. But if you actually went and quantified the differences, it's actually pretty small. Or if you did a comparison back to back, you'd see how small it is. But in this particular case, like frame rate and refresh rate and all of that has been really important for gamers for a while because we have seen tangible jumps in the in the technology and it's translated you know with evidence 
that it looks better, feels better, seems smoother, all that sort of stuff. Our eyes are detecting more smooth motion, better frame rates, and so on. But we're getting to the point of diminishing returns, a little bit like 4K to 8K or 8K to 16K. We're going to get to a point where we just can't tell the freaking difference on our 75-inch TV. <laughs> Same things here. Uh, I don't think anybody with a 240 hertz or 144 hertz monitor is going to see substantial differences between that and this. But if you don't already have something higher than 60 or 59, then maybe this is the jump to take because now you're going to be so maxed out it'll never matter. Unless, and, depending on the price, right? Unless you're just paying true. for something that doesn't matter. But you're also getting other things like the, the reflex latency analyzer and, and, and stuff like that, which that might make it worthwhile. But the 360 hertz may not be the thing that matters here uh, in, in your decision. The thing I took away from Wiltshire's article at PCGamer.com was that, yes, those of you saying, but I can tell the difference, can tell the difference, but it doesn't mean anything. It just means you can tell it's there. It means you notice tearing. It means that your peripheral vision is maybe a little more acute because you've trained it. It doesn't improve your gaming because it's your other visual aspects that matter in your response time. And so saying I can tell and having the feeling that it's better doesn't actually affect your gameplay. Yeah. And so but, I, I found that it might, very fascinating. Might just, it might just make your overall experience better. It yeah. might make, yes, like, and that's a different better. thing. If you're like, yeah, but it's just more yeah. enjoyable because I'm not being distracted by tearing and getting all frustrated, right? Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. Then you're back to price, and until we know that, that'll that'll be a hard thing to gauge. But yeah, sometimes the cutting edge is stuff you don't need, but you still want to be cutting. But even edge. that, it's like 50, 60. Even the ability to tell the difference starts to max out at a certain point. Maybe 100. I don't know. They don't really know. That's the yeah. thing. Different people. Everybody's different. Okay. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Microsoft has launched a three-part plan to fight deep fakes. I feel like we need to have a whiteboard up behind me. Uh, the first is a tool meant for political campaigns and journalists. This is not something you'll go download yourself. It's called the Video Authenticator. It detects, quote, the blending boundary of the deep fake and subtle fading or grayscale elements that might not be detectable to the human eye. So this is machine learning trained and it's looking for things to go, yep, that's indicative that this might be faked. Uh, it will deliver a percentage frame by frame as you're watching the video uh, that includes a square on the video showing green when the video appears to be more than 50% chance of real as well as the percentage number. And then it turns red if it's more than 50% chance faked, and you get that percentage number. The tool was trained off the Face Forensic++ Plus Plus public data set and tested on the Deepfake Detection Challenge data set. So these are top tools. Microsoft wrote, the fact that deepfakes are generated by AI that can continue to learn makes it inevitable that they will beat conventional detection technology. So they're not saying this is the silver bullet. They're saying this is part of an arms race. However, in the short run, such as the upcoming U.S. election, advanced detection technologies can be a useful tool to help discerning users identify deepfakes. Microsoft's partnering with the AI Foundation to make the tool available to organizations that need it. Campaigns and journalists can contact the Reality Defender 2020 project to learn more. That's at rd2020.org. Uh, Microsoft isn't stopping there, though. It knows deepfakes can slip through detection. It's also working on a system to let content producers add digital hashes and certificates to their media. This would allow you to verify authenticity. Users could install a browser extension, and then as we are looking at something, if we know it's from a creator that says, yes, I've, I've authenticated mine, you can check certificates and match hashes to certify with high accuracy whether that's the authentic content unaltered. Microsoft made that tool for the BBC-led Trusted News Initiative. Its verification arm called Project Origin will test the system with the aim of making it the standard. So the first project, the authenticator, the video authenticator, aims to detect fakes. If it doesn't detect a fake, that doesn't mean it isn't fake, but the ones it does detect are very likely fakes. So that's useful on one side. The second project is the other side. It aims to detect reality. If content isn't authenticated, it doesn't mean it isn't real, but if it does validate with this tool, it very likely is real. 
Now, there's a third system I mentioned. It's just general awareness. So Microsoft's partnering with the University of Washington, a deepfake detection database company called Sensity, and USA Today to raise awareness of deepfakes. The partnership launched the Spot the Deepfake Quiz at aka.ms slash spot deepfakes, where you can learn about synthetic media, develop critical media literacy skills, and gain awareness of the impact of synthetic media on democracy. If you're like, I already know deepfakes exist, this will help you understand what they can and can't do. Uh, they're also going to support a public service announcement campaign to encourage people to pause and make sure information is reputable before they share or promote it. So I noticed something the other day on Facebook. Uh, there was a video that got a lot of traction. I'm mean, going to have to get into the actual video, but it was a video that uh, was edited to look like an interview happened that never happened. Um, and that's not a deep fake. No, it's that not. It was at just all. an edit. Yeah. yeah, which is why, which is why I bring it up. If if this stuff could also, I know they're not stating this directly. It's all about deep fakes. But if this stuff could also help us down that road, because I'm, I'm, I'm actually it a could. little more worried about the that. The second tool will, could help there. If the original video maker had authenticated it right. and you had an extension running, you would have been able to see, oh, this has been altered by that extension. Now, that said, we didn't need the help. Everyone very quickly said, ah, that's been edited. Like, I found out about that video because someone was pointing out that it had been edited, not because I saw the original video. Right, yeah, and it, I guess what I'm saying is, at the point of view, deep fakes or edits, whatever they may be, at the point of viewership, that's when this needs to happen, or that's what we need to work toward. Because finding out after the fact, or after it's been shared 50,000 times, oh, by the way, that's fake. Well, then a lot of people that already, it fits their narrative, have already accepted it as real and moved on to five other videos that may have been real or fake. And they're not even remembering that when they just know it, you know, served the purpose it served. I think I think ultimately it'd be great if my 82-year-old mom could see a video and see that there's a little dot at the bottom that says, you know, does not authenticate or whatever. And give her a little bit of hover over information or something. I, something like that I feel like is the future for this stuff. And if not, then it's a lot of, well, I found out later. Or I was, I'm media savvy, so I understand when this stuff's fake because I learned this thing. So now I got to tell all my friends who aren't that way. Like, it just feels like we need a, I don't know if it's a standard or not, but some way of like, oh, yeah, this is fake and I'm being told that it is. Or, and it's not just simply like Twitter saying manipulated media, click if you still want to see it. Like, more than that, <laughs> like metadata. I would like to see more of that happen and come out of these great programs. These are great. I love to see Microsoft doing this. This is great. Yeah, I mean, this stuff is this is this is very cool. And I was mentioning to the guys before the show, quite honestly, I mean, I'm glad it hasn't happened, but I am shocked that deep fake stuff hasn't become more of a uh, way to get out of you know bad behavior. And I don't. I mean. Not even calling out anybody specifically, but I can think of, you know, videos, yeah, that were made to look like somebody was saying something that they weren't. And then another video, and maybe these are, you know, opposing views on, on one hand, where I kind of go like, well, that one was, so this one probably is also fake, right? Because they're just using the same uh, methodology. But that's not necessarily true. And I just don't, I don't see a lot of people being like, that's clearly a fake video. I never said those things. Um, at which case somebody who is also in the room would have to be like, well, you did, and I have you on a recording. And then there's a whole, you know, there, there's a whole other conversation to be had, but I'm surprised, especially in, you know, it certainly in the U S, um, a heating up political climate that we haven't seen more conversations about deep fakes beyond kind of stuff that someone says, like, look at what happened. And then a bunch of other people go, that's just fake. Yeah. yeah because it's really hard to make this stuff stick. Keep in mind that what we get upset about is that somebody uh, was spreading it around. What we don't seem to see is people changing their mind. Right. Usually people swayed by a deep fake are swayed because it reinforces what they already believe and pointing out that it's fake doesn't change that because they already believed it. Yeah. So this stuff really doesn't have much of an effect because it's very quickly outed, which I think is why, Sarah, you don't see people trying to like use deep fake, like, oh, that's not real, it was fake, because it's very quickly shown that it is real. Uh, mm. It doesn't, I mean, we can, I think it's important, I think the awareness part of this is the most important uh, versus actually trying to catch stuff because 
it doesn't seem to actually change minds, just reinforces people. And, and awareness is the best way to keep going along that route of like, be, you know, be skeptical about what you see. Pause before you share something to make sure it's true. Well, uh, don't pause before you jump into the conversation in her Discord because everything there is true. Like, you know, grain of salt, but they're wonderful people. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Right before the show, Big Jim wrote in our Discord regarding autonomous vessels, because we were talking about autonomous boats yesterday on the show. Big Jim says, yes, it makes sense for smaller applications such as sea, uh, subsea cable lane or basic exploration, whale monitoring. Yes, we still have vessels to do that. However, I can tell you there's a huge amount of interest from the steamship lines right now for containerized vessels and row row, which is roll on, roll off, like a car carrier, vessels to go down the automated road. There are several reasons for this, but the most current is thanks to the wonderful joker of 2020, COVID. Due to COVID, there's been less and less opportunities for vessels to change out their crews. In fact, the Seafarers International Union allowed vessels to maintain the same crews beyond the normal three to five months by an extra three to four months, then when they finally did start to swap out crews, there was no country willing to allow the transfers to take place for over a month. So don't count out the big nine VOCCs, that's Vessel Ocean Common Carrier, to try and push this as much as possible. In fact, reported last year on DTNS, I brought up the story that Mitsui Ocean Line, or MOL, which is a member of the one federation of Japanese VOCCs, has been testing autonomous vessels between mainland China and Japan. Thank you, Big Jim, for always being on the beat. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, seriously. Also, thanks to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, and Reed Fishler. Also, thanks to the one, the only Scott Johnson. Scott, what's been going on? Well, I'm happy to report that Tom and I and our little project on the side, Current Geek Chronicles, which we've been working very hard on, is in full swing for its season. Uh, episode two dropped yesterday uh last night you can grab it now if you're already subscribed to current geek you'll get it if you haven't then you can go find current geek chronicles at currentgeek.com or wherever you get your podcast we do a deep dive on sort of why is wrestling so popular why do people nerd out about it the way that others nerd about their favorite thing tom and i are a little bit noobs to it although we know enough about wrestling to get in trouble so this is a great way to educate ourselves pull in some great guests actual pro wrestlers and talk about it I think people are really like it. It's wrapped up in a very entertaining, cool package. That's at currentgeek.com. Uh, go check it out and give it a listen. Yeah, and it's not just about wrestling. And the wrestling episode is great, whether you like wrestling or not. Uh, but we also have an episode already in there about the history of the term mana, how it ended up in video games. We've got one coming out uh, about the violent video game panic of the 1990s. We've got one coming out about all those cables. Why do we have so many different cables? Scuzzy and USB. Uh, so you want to get in on this and stay subscribed, Current Geek. Dot com. You can also support this show and get all kinds of cool content as well, including Know a Little More. Know a Little More is a podcast you can subscribe separately out there in the wild world, or you can just have it delivered to you on a plate, uh, or rather in an RSS feed at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and we do love your feedback, so keep it coming. We're also live Monday through Friday, and we would love you to join us at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Justin Robert Young is with us tomorrow. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>